Amen. He's done a bunch, hadn't he? I'm telling you, we serve a great God. There's no getting around that. Turn with me, if you would, to 1 Samuel chapter 17. 1 Samuel 17. Now, we have started this message a few weeks ago, and it talks about confronting the enemy. And we're dealing with David and Goliath, and we're talking about some different aspects to confronting the enemy, how we confront the enemy. And we're just a couple of messages into this, today being the third. And I'm sure you're very familiar with this, but just to refresh your memory so that we make sure that we're all on the same page. Um, David and Goliath, the issue of this was we're told that David, who was a shepherd boy, and uh, he was taking care of his sheep and such forth, and his dad came to him and said, we have three of your brothers that are on the front lines fighting the Philistines. And uh, we need you to gather up some goods, take some food to them, nourish them while they're on the battlefield, send them out there. And so while he is out there, the Israeli army is there on the front lines. And while he is there bringing food to his brothers, uh, the champion of the Philistines, Goliath, steps up. And Goliath, when he steps up, he begins to make fun of their God and he begins to ridicule them and to uh, make fun of them. And, and he challenges them that if one of their men would come out and battle him, that just they could, they could avoid this whole conflict if they could just two of them come into battle and whoever wins that battle, the other would then become the servants of that nation. But no one in the Israeli army would step up. They were all afraid of this giant. By the way, if you check all the, the statistics and what have you, it sounds like Goliath was somewhere in the neighborhood of about nine foot tall. He was prepared for battle. His spearhead weighed 15 pounds. His coat weighed 125 pounds. This is a big guy. I mean, he is ready for battle. And so when we look at this picture, what we realize is that it seemed like a time where confronting the enemy was going to be more than they could bear. They were afraid, they were hiding, and when David come on the scene, he couldn't believe that his beloved brothers and the people that he cared for, his kinsmen, would not step up to fight this Goliath. And so he decided, I'll be the one. David says, I'll step up, I'll be the one. And when we look at this, we're approaching this message with kind of a handful of questions. Because when we're confronting the enemy, there are a lot of different things that we have to consider. And the first question that we answered in regard to this is this. What will you do when your situation looks desperate? And we talked about that. We delivered that question and we realized in the end that we have no choice but to step up under, God, uh, under this giant because, quite frankly, our God is bigger than anything else we can face. We also talked about how approaching the Goliath, the giants in our own life, with the measure of faith that God would have us to. Now keep in mind, Goliath just represents all the giants we might face in our own life. I mean, every one of us probably have some things that we have to deal with. We have illnesses, we have financial issues, we have uh, times where we have conflict. You name it, we have giants in our life. We have things that we got to deal with. And so what we realize is, what are we going to do when it looks so desperate that we just can't win? I remember that moment sitting on a pew at uh, Salem Baptist Church down in Kentucky. And my dad was preaching a revival meeting. I was a 12-year-old boy sitting on that pew. And he began preaching, and I realized at that moment, for the first time in my life, I realized, you know what? You die, you're going to go to hell. And it was such a desperate moment for me. I realized there was nothing I could do to change that. There was nothing I could do to fix that. There was nothing I could do to, you know, to work my way into heaven or do anything such as that. And I came to realize that evening in that service that my only hope was Jesus Christ. Amen. What do you do when times look desperate? You take desperate measures. And you evaluate your life and you look at where you are and you look to the only one that can give you that comfort and that strength and can and give you that salvation. That was Jesus Christ for me. We then ask the question, what do you do if everybody that you have come to love and to trust and to care for abandon you in a time of need and you're forced to stand all by yourself to face your giant? That's where David was. David was forced to stand against Goliath all by himself because no one else would step up. David, just a shepherd, 
uh, taking care of uh, his sheep, comes out to bring food to his brothers and finds himself in a battle against Goliath. And no one else was willing to step up. These men who had been trained for war, these people who had been trained for battle, even his own king said, nope, not going to do it. And he stepped up and he fought the battle. So what do you do when everybody you love and everybody you trust step back and do not support you in this? In fact, what we're going to find out today is this. There's a third question, and that third question is this. What do you do when all of those who have chosen not to step up now are trying to discourage you from stepping up? This is the life of David. David says, I'll take care of it. I'll go fight Goliath. Even told Saul, he said, hey, listen, he says, king, he says, I fought a bear, I fought a lion, rescued the lamb. And when the, uh, when the lion, you know, I went after him, and when the lion turned on me because I had taken the lamb back from him, I grabbed him by the beard and I killed him. He says, I'll, I'll take care of Goliath. I'll step up to Goliath. And from that moment on, everybody began to discourage him. His brothers are going, you're just full of mischief. You just came here to make fun of us. You just come here to cause a problem. David says, no, I, no, 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 no. I'm going to fight the Goliath. I'm going to fight the giant. I need to stand up against the, the giant. So what are you going to do when the people you love, the people you care for, set out to discourage you? It's a tough battle. It's a tough battle. I had talked to a friend of mine one time who was setting out on the mission field. And, and he was all excited about it. Man, I, I, really have, I, I really feel like this is what God would have me to do. And, and I want to go on the mission field. And his parents, this, this guy's about 20 years old, and the parents tell him, they say, oh, no, 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 you can't do that. That would be awful. You'll have to deal with this and you'll have to deal with that. Don't go, don't go, don't go. And he said, but God would have me to go. What other choice do I have? Oh, please, don't go. And the people in his church are going, don't go. You don't want to go. It ultimately even came down to this. The church said, we're not going to support you because we don't think you need to go. People he loved, people he cared for, would not support him and would not encourage him, but rather tried their very best to keep him from going on the field. What a sad commentary. But this is where David is. He tells us this in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 28. Uh, he says, and, he, and Eliab, his, uh, Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spake unto the men. And Eliab's anger was kindled against David. And he said, why camest thou down hither? And with whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know thy pride and naughtiness of thine heart. For thou art come down that thou mightest see the battle. And David said, what have I now done? Is there not a cause? David's going, what have I done? I'm willing to step up and fight the giant. What have I done? I haven't come here to make fun of you guys. I didn't come here to cause a problem. You know, somehow or another, we have to learn and we have to understand how to tune out the critics. At some point in time, we have to learn that. My dad, when he sat me down, I, I actually, at the time where I had, had uh, accepted this church to pastor, my dad sat me down and gave me a little, little lesson, because my dad had been pastoring for a lot of years, and he had told me, he says, listen, the one thing that you're going to face, and it's the hardest thing that you face, is the critics. He says, one of the diff most difficult things you're going to have to deal with is discouragement in the ministry. Because people you love and people you care for are going to discourage you. He said, there are going to be times where you're going to, you're going to work all week long. You're going to pray over a message. You're going to, you're going to prepare that message. And you're going to, to look forward to preaching. You can't wait to preach it. And you're going to get there and there's not going to be people there. Discouraging. He says, I realize that you grew up in a family where when the church doors were open, we were there. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, Sunday school, you name it, when the doors are open, we were there because we believed in being there because not only was it important to be there for the purpose of hearing God's word, but to encourage the brethren. And he says, as a pastor, you're going to learn something that the people in your church aren't always thinking about encouraging you. You're going to see a crowd on Sunday morning and you're going to see a handful on Sunday night. He says, it's discouraging. 
Because people you love and people you care for are not going to step up and say, listen, we love you so much, Pastor. We want to encourage you in the ministry. We're going to be there to say amen. We're going to be there to support that ministry. And we're going to be there to encourage the folks that come out to here. So they're not always going to do that. It's been true. It's been true statements. He said there are times when you're going to go and preach revival meetings and you're going to think, man, you're going to change the world. And you're going to go and it's like, it just fell on deaf ears. He said the ministry can be discouraging. There are going to be times when, when people are going to say nice things in front of you, but then when it comes right down to, to the nitty gritty, they're not always going to be there to support you. You're going to want them to come out and to help in ministry. You're going to want them to come out and do things, and they're not going to be there for you. My dad shared that with me, and he said, listen, he said, Barry, the thing you need to learn is you cannot be discouraged. There are going to be folks who are not going to like what you preach. They're not going to like things you say. They're not going to like some of the things you do. And they're going to be very outspoken and very critical about it. But let me tell you something. Don't get discouraged. Because it is not the people that you're trying to please. We are to be pleasing under the Lord. And he said, realize that your Lord and your Savior will always encourage you and will always lift you up. So I have to admit that one of the most difficult things in life to deal with is the discouragement. And David's brothers had nothing good, nothing positive to say to David. Rather, they just tried to discourage him from facing this giant. Don't do it. Don't do this. Don't step out. You know, uh, there was some mention of Jeremiah. Uh, Brother Jacques mentioned Jeremiah earlier. You know, Jeremiah had issues with this. In fact, you look in Jeremiah's ministry, he had a lot of times where he was really discouraged because there were a lot of folks who did not listen. God had called upon him to prophesy to Judah, for example, and to tell them, listen, God is going to punish you. You guys are going to be taken captive. If you don't straighten up like now, God's going to do something with you. And not only would the people not listen, but they were very critical of him and said, who do you think you are? And they beat him and they put him in stocks overnight, you know, just to let him know that we mean business. Stop doing what you're doing. And Jeremiah was so discouraged. Jeremiah got to this place where it just broke his heart. He became discouraged. Listen to this. Jeremiah said this. Then I said, I will not make mention of him nor speak any more in his name. But his word was in my heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones, and I was weary with forbearing, and I could not stay. You know, being a faithful servant of Jesus Christ is not always easy. Jeremiah knew that, realized that. He realized, okay, fine, I'm not going to say anything else, I'm done. But God wouldn't let him go. God still burdened him. I did a ministry sometimes at the, um, uh, I'm trying to think of what the name of it is, where the, 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 race, the horse racing out on River Road. Can't think of it. River Downs. At River Downs. And I used to do a ministry there where I preached to the jockeys. Well, the funny thing is, you could go one day and you might have 20 jockeys. You might go another day and have zip. I prepared the same for those days when I had zero as I did the days I had 20. Because you never knew who was going to show up. And, and you would go praying all the way there, God, please let some guys be there that I can share Christ with. And they would never come in at the same time. Sometimes you'd be preaching, and you'd have two or three, and, and about halfway through your message, another two or three would come. You'd preach the same message about three or four times when you would go to preach, because these guys only got half, and you'd go back and cover this half, and then you'd have to keep on going again. And, and these guys, after they heard the, old, the whole message, sometimes they'd just get up and go and you're preaching to a new crowd, you'd have three or four different crowds, if you would, during your message time. It was really difficult to get used to. And sometimes that gets really discouraging because it's like, man, nothing seems to be coming of this. Nothing seems to be coming. And it can discourage you. Man, sometimes the giant in your life is so discouraging because you can't seem to beat it. I've watched folks who have been dealing with, with things that, Maybe their giant is, is a health issue, and, and it just beats them up so bad that it just keeps them discouraged. And it's hard not to be discouraged. I've seen others where their financial issues are so desperate 
that they get so, so discouraged and they just can't seem to get back on top just to make ends meet and hurts them. And the discouragement is sometimes just unbearable. You know, sometimes it's hard to be that godly servant when you feel unappreciated even by the people that, that you love and the people you've devoted your time and attention to. Sometimes even abused by those that you've shown so much support to and so much that you've done for them. And it sometimes gets really discouraging. You know, at times discouragement sets in and the thought that comes to your mind is, I'm done, I quit. That's what Jeremiah was. Jeremiah says, I'm done. I'm done. Nobody's going to listen. I quit. I can't get them to listen. These are people. I'm trying to help them. They're going to go into captivity. They're going to, Babylon's going to come and they're going to overtake them. They're going to go into captivity. Please, come on. Listen. Just listen. David, he's going to go face Goliath. If Goliath wins, everybody goes into captivity. Come on. Just give me some encouragement. Come on, just, just encourage me. At least tell me you're going to be praying for me. At least tell me that you're going to pray that God will give me the strength and the wisdom that I need at this moment. Just give me something. Don't just criticize me and cross your arms and be mad. Just let him go. He's always full of himself. Just let him go. Man, what David needed was people that would love him and care for him and support him and strengthen him. But what he got was a family that discouraged him, was a nation that discouraged him. And I got to tell you, we've all been there, haven't we? You ever felt like a failure? You ever felt like you couldn't please anybody? Have you ever felt like, you know what, I just don't have it anymore. I just can't seem to do this anymore. I'm kind of done. I've seen people do that in their marriage where they say, I'm just fed up. I don't know if I, I can't, I don't have the fight in me anymore. I've watched them in dealing with their, their children. It's like, I don't know where to go from here. I'm just done. Just done. I've watched it so many different times where we get so discouraged that we feel like quitting. One thing Jeremiah knew was this. When Jeremiah was dealing with that, he said, you know, I feel like quitting, but my heart just burned. God's word was in my heart and I couldn't just let it go. He knew, that, listen, I either need to be all in or get out of the way. Something has to happen. There cannot be this lukewarm feeling. Either he was all in or he was all out. And I've learned over the years, even as God has dealt with my heart and dealt with my life, the last thing that you can be is lukewarm. Nothing gets done. Nothing gets done. Get your feelings hurt. Get discouraged. Get down. Feel like quitting. And we need to be all in. We need to realize that, listen, this battle is God's battle. It's not the battle that other people have told me to fight. It's a battle that God has placed me in. Let's take one more look at Jeremiah, just for kicks. In Jeremiah chapter 20 and verse 10, he says this, For I heard the defaming of many, fear on every side, report, say they, and we will report it. All my familiars watched for my halting. They watched for me to fail. Everybody that stood back and criticized me or just watching for me to fall on my face. Preadventure, he will be enticed. We shall prevail against him. We shall take our revenge on him. That's their concept. When he fails, we'll say, I told you so. When he fails, we'll go on with our life and we'll say, you know what? I knew nothing would come of that anyway. But the Lord, is with me as a mighty, terrible one. Saying, listen, but listen, we have God on our side. We talked about this the last time. We have God watching over this so that when we're talking about standing alone, we never really stand alone because God is always standing with us. But here we find out also that, listen, when everybody is discouraging you, when you feel like you've been beaten down, when nobody stands with you, we understand the God that we serve. And know that he is greater than all. You know how many times have you talked to folks who grew up in a family who didn't trust the Lord. And, and who were angry even at the decisions that you had made about trusting Jesus Christ as your Savior. How, how many times have you talked to po folks that, that were saved and, and they have to wrestle with their family. Maybe even to get baptized or to, to follow in church membership or to, to do the things that they need to do. 
to be involved in the things they need to be involved in, to, to get involved in ministry. they got family that are always trying to criticize them and beat them down and keep them out of church. And what we find is sometimes, even when we are discouraged, we need to look to the Lord and say, but I serve a God that is a terrible God. And he don't mean terrible in the sense that he's bad. He means terrible in the sense that he is mighty and powerful and awesome. So when we look at this picture, you need to know critics are everywhere. Nehemiah battled critics when he set out to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. He sure did. In fact, outside the walls, there was Sam Violet and his army. And they were going, you guys are crummy builders. That wall is going to fall down. If a fox crawls up on it, it's going to fall down. Ha <laughs> ha. They were critical. On the inside, he had people that were disgruntled because the work was hard and there was a lot of rubbish and, and their own work, their homes and such were not getting done. And they're going, this is hard because we've got stuff we need to be doing and there's so much trash, how are we going to get this thing done? So he's got a disgruntled group of workers. He's got people on the outside that wants them to fail. Then he's got another group on the inside that has an allegiance with the people on the outside and they're reporting back and forth and keeping a lot of rumors going on about Nehemiah. Nehemiah's like, seriously, the battle. But I serve a God who is greater. And I serve a God who can see us through this. Folks, understand and know that even when the folks that you love and care for discourage you, God is still with you. And that God can accomplish things that you can't even imagine. You know, if you're doing the Lord's work, you're going to have critics. I'm here to tell you, you're going to have critics. You're going to ask Brother Cody in times that we go out and do distribution, whether it's handing out flyers, whether it's knocking on doors. There's very often we get phone calls. We get stuff put back in our mailbox. And as a matter of fact, we had some stuff in our mailbox the other day with a long letter about how horrible it was that we distribute this stuff in the community and, uh, and, and put it out there. And, and they don't want to see it. They don't want to hear it. And they stuff it back in my mailbox and said, keep it for yourself. And I, I opened it up, and, uh, and it wasn't even from our church. <laughs> okay, that's all right. I don't mind being critical of us. And, even thinking we're the ones that are doing this, and, uh, it's okay. We both kind of had a chuckle out of it. But it is what it is. We sometimes see our name on the Fairfield page because people don't like the signs that we put up when we actually have a sign, by the way. <laughs> but here's what we find. It doesn't matter who the critics are. We can't let them discourage us. David wasn't discouraged by his brother's criticism. He wasn't discouraged by the criticism of all the other army. He wasn't discouraged by the criticism of even King Saul. Because he's looking at them and they had already quit. Folks, I, the last person we need to be discouraged by are people that have already quit the battle. We're going to stand up and we're going to fight. I don't know if you guys know who he is, but George Washington Gethels. If you've ever done any, I, I, I like history. Got any history buffs here? All right, you guys may know who he is then. He was the final guy that worked on the uh, Panama Canal. All right? Now, just keep in mind, there's a lot of people that kind of worked on the Panama Canal and that kind of thing. But he was the last one that had been given the task of completing the Panama Canal. I mean, the Panama Canal, for those of you that have studied anything, you understand and know that it was like a, a huge cesspool of money. I mean, just tons. And people died trying to build it, going through a land that was terrible and horrible and, and uh, got a lot of criticism from the states uh, in regard to building it. It was just a mess. But he had to endure criticism from the newspapers. He had to endure criticism from politicians. And, and it was a total lack of trust from all of the media, all of the politicians from here back home while he built this canal. And so uh, they were saying, well, he'll never get it done. We're just, we're just soaking all this money into something that will never be completed. You know, people, is a, this is an absolute and total mess. And they would ask him, you know, what, why are you doing this? And he refused to answer. He said, I ain't got time for all that. And he just kept building. Finally, somebody comes and said, why won't you answer the critics back home? Why don't you just say something? And his reply was, in time. And they said, why? Why will you not do it now? And how will you do it later? And he just looked at him. He says, it's easy. I'll do it with a canal. The answer is always, I'll do it 
when you see that God's work has been accomplished. You know, when I came to the Hilltop Baptist Church, I'm going to be real honest with you, there was people that tried their best to talk me out of it. Hilltop Baptist Church had at one time run about 300 plus. Uh, at the time they were considering me for pastor, we had 20 plus. My first service, we had 22 people. And some were saying, it's a, it's a, the church is devastating, you don't want to go there. Man, they've got debt over their heads, and there's only a few people, and those few people that are there are in the process of leaving. It's a, it's, it's, a, it's a church that's gone. Don't go there. Don't go there. It'll be the death nail to your ministry. Don't go there. I had never pastored before. I was too stupid to know. <laughs> this is my very first ministry. And I said, but I, I really do believe this is where God would have me to be. Don't go there. You will not have a ministry if you go there. Don't go there. People I love, people I cared for are going, don't go there. Bad idea. You're young. I was. Tr tr I have been young, honestly. I, I was young one time. You're young. You're 27 years old. Don't go there. Wait. Get a better calling. The other churches that might like for you to go there, don't go there. Bad idea. I didn't think so. I knew in my heart it was where God wanted me to be. I'm not going to lie to you. It was difficult. It's a tough battle. Uh, I, I've shared this before. The very first message I preached as a pastor, 22 people there. On the way out the door, eight of them said, Preacher, we'll never be back. I thought, well, that's encouraging. <laughs> but here's the deal. Understand and know that, listen, God can do things that we can't do. David had to understand that it, I, I'm not going to be discouraged by others that don't know. I, know. I know what God's doing in my life. I know what God would have me to do. And so what we find is that David stepped up. Here's what he knew. He knew that he needed to focus on God's presence in his life. Chapter 16, Samuel had anointed David to be king. And we're told this in chapter 16. The Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So here's what we know, that now in chapter 17, when David comes to confront his brothers and to confront his king, and primarily to confront Goliath, he did so in the spirit of the Lord. He had God on his side. And when you know that you are confronting this, when you know that you're standing up against your Goliath with God on your side, then let me tell you something, I don't care who's against me. David knew that God was with him. And he also knew that if God's with him, then all the promises that God has in store for us is with him as well. How can we be discouraged knowing the promises of God? Let me give you a little New Testament. In the New Testament, we find this. We find in, in um, 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, that God tells us this. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of our Lord Jesus Christ, or, or of Jesus our Lord. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. Now here's what I want you to hear. Listen to this. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. Let me say that again. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Now I want to share something with you because there are two types of promises. Simple, right? Number one, there is a, an unconditional promise. God says, when you, you know, based upon the fact that you are my child, you've trusted me as your Lord and Savior, these promises are yours, Period. All right, these are yours. You have a home in heaven, you're going to be in fellowship with God for all eternity, and so on down the line. These promises are yours. Be, the Holy Spirit will live within you. You'll dwell with me. Um, those are promises that are unconditional. There's nothing I can do to get rid of those promises. But there are promises that are also conditional. If you will do this, I will do that. We have those. He talks about the five crowns. Those are rewards that are given to us based upon things that we do. We understand that our works play a part of this. 
what I do with what God has given me will also give me great rewards. Now, I'm going to be really honest with you here. I want everything God has in store for me. I'm not trying to be arrogant. I'm not trying to be holier than thou. But I'm here to tell you, if God has something that he wants me to have, I want it. And whatever it takes for me to obtain that, I want to do it. Don't get satisfied with what you want to do, but don't be satisfied until you feel confident you're doing what God wants you to do. In the life of David, he was willing to face Goliath because he knew there were greater promises that God would have in store for him. You see, God gave him the ability to confront Goliath. But because he confronted Goliath, there were greater blessings that he received as a result of it. Folks, I am not going to let some Yehu who has already quit, some Yehu who doesn't understand and doesn't know the ministry like God has given me the ability to know, it's some guy that doesn't or has already kind of bailed out on everything that God would have them to do, somebody whose life is not where it ought to be, living the life they want instead of the life God wants, I am not going to let my life be dictated and governed by them. Do not let those who have already quit discourage you from doing what God would have you to do. I'm not in any notion for that. I'll just tell you now, I'm not in any notion for that. I was playing football my junior high year. And in junior high, uh, we was playing, and, and there was, I, I've talked about this guy before, and in our practice, there was this guy, his name Sparky Mertz. I'm telling you now, Sparky Mertz was the toughest guy I knew up to that point in my life. And uh, I was a lineman, and in practice, We'd go against one another and that kind of thing. And the position I was doing in practice was going against Sparky Mertz. He hurt. I'm going to tell you now, every time I went up against Sparky Mertz, he hurt me. My chest would hurt. My arms would hurt. And this other, me and this other guy, we kept switching out just like they were switching him, Sparky out, you know, giving us a break here and there. And it was my turn to go in. And, uh, and I noticed they were putting Sparky in just the same time it was my turn to go in. And I turned around and told the guy, I said, hey, I, I need to fix my shoe. It's all messed up. <laughs> you need to go. He said, I ain't going to get Sparky. I'm not going in. That guy would hurt me something awful. But I got to tell you, every time I went against him, I learned something new. And I got better, and I got better, and I got better. And the coach noticed it. Next thing you know, I wasn't going against Sparky anymore because I made the first string. And me and Sparky were side by side, wreaking havoc on everybody who wanted to go up against us. Why? Because I stood the test, made myself do it, got up there and did what I needed to do. Sometimes the things that God would have us to do aren't going to be easy. Sometimes they're going to feel like they're just beating us down. But I'm here to tell you, we need to stand the test. We need to stand up and we need to do what God had called us to do because we want all the blessings that God would have us to have. And I don't want the critics to rob me of my blessings because somebody else doesn't like the way I'm doing it, because somebody else doesn't like, you know, me. I'm not going to let them rob the blessings that God wants for me. David understood God's blessings. Had I listened to folks back 40 years ago, we wouldn't be standing here today, would we? And I'm here to tell you, there's blessings that come with 40 years of ministry. You know, just having the opportunity to have folks uh, tell you they love you. And to be able to look back and see folks that you know you had a hand in their ministry and had a hand in their coming to know Christ and had a hand in their discipleship and their growth means a lot. Had I listened to the critics 40 years ago, I'd have missed many of the blessings that God gave me. You know, David understood God's blessings. His faith allowed him to save his sheep from the lion and the bear. And he wanted that same blessing by defeating Goliath. He could not be discouraged because he knew what his God could do. Know this also, that God has trusted you with a mission. David knew that God had trusted him with the task of killing Goliath. He said, are you sure of that? Yeah, 1 Samuel 17, 45, David told this to Goliath. I come to thee in the name of of the Lord of hosts. Now, I don't know about you, but you don't go to somebody in, so, in, in somebody else's name unless they gave you permission to do so. 
You can't go to somebody and say, hey, listen, Barry told me to come to you. No, not unless I said something. You can't call out my, you can't use my name like that unless I said it's okay to do that. He knew that when he came to Goliath and he came in the name of the Lord, it was because it was the Lord who had given him permission to do so. We get it. We understand that. I can only do something like that if the Lord sanctioned it. I don't do what I'm, I don't say, well, I'm doing this ministry in the name of the Lord unless I feel confident it was God that sent me. A pastor friend uh, who was discouraged in the ministry called me, it's just been a few weeks ago, called me and he asked me about, you know, how do you know if maybe it's time for you to kind of leave the ministry? He's a young guy. He said, I'm not even sure if I should be this, do, stay here. I don't know what I should do. And I said, you're talking about just leaving your church? You're talking about getting out of the ministry altogether? He said, I'm talking about just being done, period. And here's what I asked him. I said, did you choose the ministry or did God choose for you the ministry? I said, if you chose the ministry, you need to leave. You need to get out. Go do something else. But if you believe with all your heart that God chose you for the ministry, then understand this. It's not your choice. It's God's. You can't do what God has done. You can't undo what God has done. David came in the name of the Lord, so he knew this is the Lord's battle, this is not mine. He got it. He realized that this is God who had brought him to this place at this time. You know, according to Romans 1.1, 1, 1, the apostle Paul believed that God called him to be an apostle. He got it. I like what he tells Timothy, 2 Timothy 2.4, no uh, no man that warreth entangle himself with the affairs of this life. Listen to what he says to Timothy. That he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. Now I'm going to tell you what. God chose me to fill this pulpit. God chose me for this ministry. God chose me to do the things that God has chosen me to do. David knew I'm the guy to face Goliath. I'm the guy. You know, you may be dealing with things in your life that no one else has ever dealt with. God placed those things in your life. You know, you think about things in your life that have been difficult. Debbie and I, we were talking about this one day, and, you know, with, with our son Chris, who had passed away when he was 13. God gave that to us. He trusted that with us. He trusted us with Chris for 13 years. He trusted that with us. He trusted with somebody else. He trusted that we would make the best use of that. He trusted that we would do what was right with that. The only way we can deal with the giant is to realize God has placed us in the position to deal with the giant. I am not going to let some quitter discourage me, some critic discourage me from being what I need to be. Then he finishes with this. Is there not a cause? David realized there's a cause. God wants me to do this. I can't have you criticizing me and then I fail. I can't listen to the critics and say, well, they don't think I should do it this way. I better listen to them. No. I'm going to tell you now I'm going to follow God's plan, follow his will, do what God's called me to do. Because I want to follow his plan. I want to do what he wants me to do. I want to please the Lord. David defeated the giant because he wouldn't let others discourage him from doing so when you're confronting the enemy let me tell you others are going to try to discourage you do what God wants you to do follow God's plan bow your heads with me if you would dear father Lord I thank you for all you do Lord, I thank you for times even when we tend to get discouraged. Lord, for picking us up and causing us to realize this is not our battle, it's yours. Help us to focus on that. Help us to know, Lord, that you are the encourager. I love the fact that you sent the Holy Spirit of God to us to fill us. And you call him the comforter. Lord, what a great word to comfort me in times of discouragement, to comfort me in times of the critics that have that come before me, to comfort me in times where uh, the enemy seems so strong. Comfort me in knowing that you are with me. 
that you'll lead and guide me. Lord God, thank you. I pray, Father, that I please you in what I do. May each of us examine our hearts and lives and, Lord, make decisions that please you, not to follow our own will, but, Lord, your will. Lord God, we love you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand with us if you would. You know, if God